Ladies and gentlemen, let me remind you that the details will be up on the web, and we will provide both the trends in the force and Gary's presentation. I would also ask that if you have a brilliant technical question on the subject of polling, you email Gary, um, <laughs> because the answers are almost as long as the questions, um, and it is very difficult. Uh, in general, if I could ask that each person ask one question with one part, since I have noticed that people have gotten around the one question with nine part questions, uh, please uh, look around you. We don't have time for interesting speeches, but the steps outside are available for those of you who wish to give one. <laughs> and uh, finally, if I may, as you ask a question, would you please identify yourself and your organization? Uh, with those limited caveats, uh, who would like to start? Please, in the front row. Uh, Mike Delaney. Wait for the microphone, please, if you don't mind. Uh, Mike Delaney, Officer of the U.S. Trade Representative. Um, it has been my experience in southern Afghanistan that there is a fairly strong positive correlation between um, a tribal or sub-tribal affiliation and support for the Taliban. Have you, have you um, um, tried to inject a, um, a tribal or sub-tribal uh, dimension into your polling? We have to some extent, although I haven't gotten a lot out of it, and it may be simply a function of sample size, right? But one thing, of course, is you've got, uh, uh, there's not a lot of variation in, in terms of uh, ethnic identity. There's subtribal uh, differences, but there, there, there are not a, a lot of Hazaras in, in Helmand, for example, right? Uh, we, we ask ethnicity. And then we did ask a tribal element, or Durrani, et cetera, uh, but our sample sizes uh, aren't really adequate for provincial level analysis of that data, much less, uh, well, not provincial, not even regional. And nationally, we don't see substantial differences. In fact, in, 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 for instance, in, in Durrani versus other Pashtun, for example. But it's a good question. And by the way, I really value this part of the presentation because I can take some of these suggestions run our data, see if indeed we do see something, and be happy to share that with you if it shows up. Uh, the gentleman in the second row over there. I'm Malik Nugent from the Treasury Department. Um, you mentioned that 80% of the Afghan population is rural. And one of the things that we're looking at at Treasury is the expanding the reach of the formal financial sector out to those rural populations. And one question that we have, though, is to what extent do rural populations look to formal institutions based in Kabul, based in the cities, for services, for public services? Uh, to what extent do rural populations look to the formal financial sector, or would they look to the formal financial sector as opposed to traditional you know, lending, lending arrangements, and, and then extending that not just to financial systems, but to other public services as well? Yeah, I would say you should do a poll on that. <laughs> there, you know, there is a, these, are interested, uh, these are specific topics to which you could get excellent data. All I would be able to give you were, are suggestive data. But certainly, the changes that we see have to occur in rural areas. There's not enough people in the urban areas to drive these differences. So the improvements in uh, the ratings of local conditions, uh, the index of rebuilding that I discussed, the greater sense of some uh, jobs and economic opportunity clearly do exist. The improvements have occurred in rural areas, at least as much, if not more, than in, in urban areas. But in terms of specifics on the interest and reliance in microfinance or other sorts of loans, you, you'd, you'd have to go in and do that. But the guys from D3 are over there. You can get together. Let me just comment that there is a problem in defining rural areas. Some are near roads. Some are relatively dense because they're in river valleys. Mm -hmm. Others are highly dispersed. One answer to your question that would come, I think, from talking to Canadian, British, and other aid workers in the PRTs is that anything that's more than two hours walk, which is often the practical test, 
isn't accessible, but the question is, who is two hours walk from what? And mapping that is not something where it's easy to generalize by going urban to rural. Uh, let's see, the uh, second row, the gentleman there. Chris DeAngelis, uh, also from uh, the Office of U.S. Trade Representative. Um, I'll be going out to Pakistan uh, in the summer. So I'm wondering, um, you know, one of the key issues we've heard is problems with, uh, with justice and, and, and the judiciary functioning effectively, particularly in the countryside. And, and that's one reason it seems that, you know, these people turn to the Taliban because they can get something done, even if it's not, you know, it's some rough justice, but they can get something done. And do you have any data on, on how people perceive the justice system working and the government's role in it? Yeah, sadly I don't. And the reason is we made a specific decision not to go there because it's a complex enough area of questioning that you can't do it in a question. You would need a battery to really pick apart the concerns and the solutions that are in place and the preferences for alternatives. Uh, and this was about a half hour questionnaire, which is about as long as we can comfortably go without getting respondent fatigue. And, and um, others have done longer, and I start worrying about data quality. Uh, the Asia Foundation uh, has done survey research in Afghanistan that tends to be less focused than ours on political issues and on uh, uh, broader public attitudes and does drill down to some extent into uh, social uh, preferences and concerns. And that may be a place to look if you check their website. Uh, there's another way to look at this. There have been surveys done within the embassy and within the various aid teams. Uh, basically, you have at this point something approaching a court presence. That doesn't necessarily mean it's effective, but approaching something like a judicial system that affects about 9% of the population. So just in a very crude sense, is there anybody there doing anything? Those are mapped, and the answer is it affects maybe 10% of the population on a functional level. Uh, let's see, there was the young lady in the third row there. Hi, Annika Arapitsansko on the part of International. What was the percentage of women respondents uh, in your sample, and also how were you able to reach women? Okay, so the sample is about 50-50 men and women. We send out uh, separate teams of male and female interviewers um, uh, to conduct interviews of male respondents and of female respondents. Um, uh, but the, the ultimate ratio is, is 50. The, w the women interview teams, I should say, are escorted, of course. Uh, but they, uh, only women interview women. And uh, only men interview men, I believe. And indeed, we have separate sampling points for men and women in order to prevent rivalry. Uh, but yeah, it, it does reflect, the survey across the board reflects as best we can the population values in the country. One of the challenges is the population values in the country are a little sketchy, right? There hasn't been a census done in Afghanistan since 1979, I believe. But we do have a CSO, a Central Statistic Office, estimates of the population and the distribution of the population. And uh, those include the roughly 50-50 division of men and women, which we then reflect in our sampling. The gentleman in the third row in the center. Incidentally, I have a blind spot uh, on the left, so please raise your hand because I can't see you otherwise. Uh, Marvin Weinbaum, Middle East. Marvin Weinbaum, the Middle East Institute. Uh, probably one of the most surprising findings that you have is the popularity of Karzai, which is obviously, I, I, I think you, you reflected that in your remarks particularly because of our concern about the legitimacy of, of, the, of the, gov the central government, how important that is in terms of uh, support for our, our counterinsurgency. Uh, trying to understand that further, is it possible that many of the respondents saw that as, do you prefer Karzai to the alternative? Uh, so that it was in a sense there a choice there, Karzai or someone else. And also, uh, is there some explanatory value in the fact that it is well noted that in the work, in the move up to the election, Karzai uh, deliberately, in good fashion, political fashion, went and spent a lot of money in the development area. Uh, clearly, uh, uh, people are, especially with electricity, are experiencing a better uh, outcome because of that. 
Right, and has a strong effect. And I think I, I mentioned that, or tried to mention that, that the effect of campaign promises uh, can have a positive impact on... Or, or delivery, yeah, actually. Uh, delivery. Uh, delivery as well, uh, on expectations and on assessments as well. We asked about uh, Karzai both directly and elliptically, if you will, in a variety of ways, and the data are pretty consistent. We ask about his personal favorability. We ask, as we have consistently now for five years, about ratings of the performance of the government he leads. We asked uh, about, not about Karzai, Simply, are you satisfied or dissatisfied with the outcome of the election? A question that we didn't want to tie to Karzai, again, to see if we get any difference. And we get consistent readings across. I would, again, there is a halo effect of winning, of emerging victorious from a period of conflict, even if an election conflict, if you will, that we've seen in previous cultures, including our own strange culture. So that certainly is not unheard of by any means. Separately, this is a society that seems to, I don't want to go too far beyond our data, that, uh, that I think can be said to uh, value a strong and assertive leadership and the emergence of a strong and assertive leader after a period of uncertainty, again, can in indeed inform positive ratings of that leader. The question is, do they stay positive? President Obama has gone from 69 percent approval to around 50. It depends on performance, and that's why it's necessary to continue to take these measurements and assess in an ongoing way. Uh, the gentleman in the back row. Phil Mastretta, Office of the Special IG for Iraq. Uh, are you still polling in Iraq, and how much comparative analysis do you do, you do between Iraq and Afghanistan? I noticed one or two slides uh, on this point. Um, but it's become quite a cottage industry here inside the Bellway. Yeah, that's true. The, the, uh, I haven't, my last poll in Iraq was about a year ago, and I'm always looking for another opportunity and the right time. We've in the past polled around the anniversary of the invasion, but very frankly, the elections were in the way this time. I didn't want to poll in the midst of the, of the national elections there, which I would have needed to do to get results in time for the anniversary of the, of the invasion, so we let that go. Um, uh, we, we do have continued interest in, in conducting surveys in, in Iraq, uh, but it's obviously of less pressing, if I may say, news value, um, which I have to keep in mind given my employer. Um, but I think it's important, the, the, the value we can provide in doing these independent surveys as news organizations is by opening a window that many of the decision makers in our government, frankly, already have open and are looking out. There is a lot of data available in Iraq and Afghanistan, but not a lot publicly available. And I think by doing this, we can get a better public understanding by disseminating these data of uh, the decisions that are being made and the information that's informing them. And that's, frankly, why we do it, why I think it's an important project, and I'd like to continue it. I've not done a lot of comparison, some general stuff, but we've seen similar trends to some extent in Iraq and Afghanistan. In Iraq, as you know, uh, some reasonably high expectations, um, uh, and uh, no one was, well, other than Sunnis, no one was glad to see, it was sad to see Saddam gone. Uh, but then that spiral of despair in that country as it fell into sectarian violence after the Samara bombing, and then a recovery, a dramatic recovery in our last poll, which I suspect is continued uh, because violence is lower and there's a greater sense that the country is going to stay together. But there are very fundamental differences. Uh, the the w the attitude driver in, in Iraq, in many ways, was the sectarian attitudes, the Kurds and the Sunnis and the Shiites, and the question is whether they could find some accommodation. That's much less the case. There's much more uniformity across groups in our data uh, in Afghanistan, and it's much more about uh, the level of violence, the development, and, and the other measures I've discussed. I should note that both the State Department in dealing with Iraq and the State Department in dealing with Afghanistan is zero basing its models of how to measure progress in both countries with new polling elements as well as fixed indicators, uh, which is kind of interesting after nine years. It is truly zero basing. It is also doing so without any coordination with the rest of the United States government or between the Iraqi and Afghan efforts to see if there are areas of common effort. So uh, let me note that your question is a very good one, but I would be much happier if the United States government showed even the slightest interest in coordinating within itself. Um, <laughs> well, the lady in the back there. Read our latest white paper. Uh, I have unfortunately read the latest papers from state and defense as of this week. They have evidently not read your white paper. 
<laughs> All right. I'd love for you to send it to the me. The lady in the uh, yes, uh, back row. Uh, Gail Morgado from uh, SCRS, Coordinator for Reconstruction and Stabilization within the Department of State. Um, my question is, um, you uh, spent a lot on public perception uh, on military forces and, um, and the U.S. as a whole. But what about, did you ask about what the perception was of civilians working in the field and of the uh, U.S. as well as international community um, that's there and is ramping up and if that's uh, noted by Afghans at large or if that's simply not um yeah we had a favorable uh, favorability rating I believe of I don't know if we did NGOs but we did of the United Nations I believe the performance of the UN let me see if I can find it for you here it is sure uh, and it was a little underwhelming um, uh, we, we, we asked uh, ratings of the presence and the performance of the foreign aid organizations um, Half of Afghans, uh, we, it, this would make more sense too if we, if we dissected it regionally, but half of Afghans said there was a strong presence of foreign aid organizations in their area, about half said there was not. And uh, uh, um, uh, and uh, we didn't do a lot of other metrics on it. You know, I, our, our report is up at abcnews.com. Our questionnaire, again, I, I, even in a presentation of this detail, I can't hit it all because it's a half hour interview, uh, of, of, of 60 or 70 item questionnaire. But the full questionnaire and the marginal results are up at our website uh, in this document. You're welcome to take a look at. And I'm happy to run any cross tabulations anyone's interested in. So you can look through our questionnaire and say, what did that look like in the southeast or in uh, Kunduz? And, and we can run that data. I'm happy to do it. I, again, I'd be very cautious about this. Where efforts were made last year to map where the civilian aid workers were and where they reached out to. Uh, when you talk about polling nationally, you have to understand that the actual presence of civilian aid workers in the field, which is very different from seeing a project somewhere, is very limited in terms of most of Afghanistan. The other is that when you ask questions like civilian versus military or U.S. versus international components of ISAF, uh, often people think U.S. as ISAF unless they happen to know it's German or right. Swedish or what have you. Nationality differences and perceptions are extremely uncertain. So when you start doing French, German, and U.S. presence in Afghanistan, you're more likely to get misleading than positive results. Yeah, we've tried some of that, and it, it's essentially the same. In other words, if you ask about the performance of the United States or you ask about the performance of uh, NATO ISAF, it, we, we have those separate measures, and they're almost identical. I think yeah. they're conflated. The gentleman in the back. I'm Jim Durrell from, uh, from Office of Military Affairs at AID. I, I enjoy your polls. Two things I'd like to ask you, not, not in numerous parts. One, you've got some data on development, and things are going up. And I'd ask, so what? Dr. Korsman's talked about this all the time in his stuff about just having metrics of output things. Second thing is I'd ask, when you look at favorable response to the Taliban, did you get a sense of why? Why? Well, two things. So uh, 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 first, in terms of development improving, as we, as we show in our regression analysis, it is a significant predictor of positive public attitudes in terms of a uh, sense the country's going the right way, confidence in the government, in the U.S. and NATO as well. I think it's an essential element, in fact, of, of uh, public confidence and attitudes more broadly, where development is seen as occurring. I think this was the, the promise, or, or at least the perceived or taken promise, uh, of the invasion. Uh, the notion that, A, the yoke of the Taliban would be removed, and B, that much needed development in a very impoverished country would follow and that slow pace of the development, in addition to the ongoing violence, has been one of the great sources of frustration among the population. So to see those improve uh, does, in, in a very important way, I think, inform our broader judgment and understanding of, of how people are reacting to the situation. There's nothing like local development that is going to hit you personally, that's going to affect your personal life. If you've got electricity when you didn't, a road so you can get to the market in a few hours rather than a few days, all these make very important differences in living conditions and therefore are reflected in attitudes. Um, and and um, I'm sorry, your second... Your Does that lessen support for the Taliban? I mean, we can do all these things. 
<coughs> the lesson support with them, and that's what we're trying to do. So right. The second part is, why is Taliban a fractionary? Because they're not providing jobs programs, putting girls in school, doing roads. Right. Support for the Taliban, A, is not at all broad around the country. It peaks in conflict zones. And there may be some cultural or religious or political reasons for that, but uh, I think, uh, I mean, in Kandahar, it's, it's, the, it's the birthplace of the Taliban. It's where they're from, and it's where their support is essentially strongest. I, I don't know that that would be a surprise, a cultural uh, 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 an allegiance that's related to a variety of preferences, but also that these are the areas where uh, not only is development challenged, but where violence is highest. And where violence is highest, people are going to look to some solution to that violence. And if they don't see it coming from one source, there may be an increased inclination to seek it from another. It's drawn from a different source, but I think we need to be extremely careful here. First, uh, the Taliban does provide key jobs for young men, and until really late in 2009, it was paying more than the local police or the army was. So it was a major employer. Uh, prompt justice is, for many Afghans, the key to local stability. The Taliban was covering about five times the area that the Afghan government was uh, in terms of this because we focused on formal justice systems rather than traditional justice systems. And the other problem is when you talk about Taliban presence, you have to remember that, and again, the maps here are not generally distributed. And in an awful lot of areas, the Taliban is the only presence. There is no competing Afghan government presence of any kind whatsoever. Uh, so when we talk about Taliban versus NATO ISAF or Jeroa, we have to keep in mind exactly what the areas are and these. And I think one of the great problems we have had in general is the failure just in the crudest terms to map where we are active or the Afghan government is active. Because quite aside from the qualitative issue, if you're not there at all, Strangely enough, you're not taken very serious. Uh, yeah, again, as our, I think the table I showed you, our data suggests that attitudinally, it's very clear that where you're seen as having a strong presence uh, or any presence, you're much more likely to be rated positively for your performance. You'd be in real trouble if the opposite were the case, of course. Let's see. I think we let me take the question over here on the uh, left. Sorry, I couldn't see it. Craig Adair, just an interested member of the public. I have a follow-up question on ethnicity, um, and if that's if I understood your your response earlier that your sample sizes weren't large enough, but the numbers that you did get didn't pick up significant differences across ethnicity. If that's the case, how do you or do you have any explanations to offer for the difference that you the clear difference that you saw in the South and the East? Yeah, there there. There are regional differences. I haven't teased out if those are ethnic or regional differences. And we could, we could run the data to establish whether, you're right, the Pashtun in the south has, you know, as opposed to Hazara and, and uh, Tajiks uh, in the north, that may well be associated. I don't know if it's regional uh, or ethnic. And it's an analysis I haven't done. But it's one worth doing. Initially in Iraq, for example, there were suggestions <coughs> that the differences we saw there attitudinally were regionally based rather than ethnically or ethno-sectarian based. And we could dispel that pretty quickly when, when, we, when we ran that data. It was clearly eth ethno-sectarian. Uh, there are some, I mean, I shouldn't say we haven't seen any differences. I haven't seen any that have risen a level for me to spend a lot of time on them. Rural Pashtuns are more conservative, uh, more negative about the government to some extent, uh, particularly rural, to the extent I've looked at them, rural Pashtun men. Uh, uh, but uh, I haven't done a depth, an in-depth analysis of those. We've got, uh, by the way, a good robust data set now. We can combine these surveys and look at some of the basic metrics over time. And even though we've had change in the outcome, we can therefore increase the sample and look at some of the individual groups and differences among groups can stand out better. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we have kind of run over the normal hour, but let me take one last question. I think the gentleman in the <coughs> second row there. Uh, Vijay Nilekani, NEI. Uh, did, you, did the scope of your survey include uh, uh, perception of neighboring countries? 
Like, yeah. what do the Afghans think of the, the Iranians or the Tajiks or Uzbeks or Chinese or Indians? Yeah, we did uh, include some uh, favorability ratings of other countries. And consistently in our data, uh, um, uh, the country that is seen most favorably by uh, Afghans, this should not be a surprise, I hope, uh, is India. And I think that's because India is seen as a counterweight to the, uh, uh, to the Pakistanis, who are viewed with a great deal more suspicion. There's that lessened sense that Pakistan is, is harboring the Taliban, but there is still not a lot of warm feeling about Pakistan. As I check our data, 81 percent of Afghans see Pakistan unfavorably. Um, I guess you could look on the bright side and, and note that it was 91 percent the last time we asked. How about the Iranians and Chinese? Yeah, we didn't ask about uh, uh, China. We got an even split on Iran, half see around favorably, about half unfavorably. Uh, and again, the one that really jumps out at me is, is India is 71 percent favorable. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming. And may I ask you to thank Gary in the sort of traditional manner. Thank you.